Hello. Today, I thought I'd show you um, my USD Solaris workflow for kind of bringing in con concept models, look dev in, and authoring USD uh, materials, assets, if you will. Um, I'm quite new to the whole concept of Solaris and USD, like, like most people probably are. Um, so it's I'm still learning. So I thought I'd just share with you what I've done so far. Uh, I'm using Solaris and using the lots to kind of help me uh, concept an idea. So just before we dive into Houdini, just going to jump into uh, Blender. So here is the model. Now, this model, and I'll cut to the original model, was made on the iPad <laughs> one afternoon. I was binging on Netflix and I was sketching on the iPad. There is an app called Nomad Sculpt for the iPad, which is like a kind of a sculpting um, app. And all this was made on on the iPad using like it bashing shapes together. And it's just kind of almost like voxels. You can kind of remesh and then you can actually um, retopologize stuff as well automatically and things like that. So it's good for organic modeling. It's not the best for kind of this mechanical base stuff. So I kind of pushed it to a limit and the model itself was kind of not fantastic so i had to do a lot of cleanup so really if you have a good modeler who has the ability to kind of create the designs you want or you can do this yourself in other modeling programs like blender or plasticity or completely in houdini using houdini modeler if you want it or zbrush it really doesn't matter where you do the model um you just need to make sure that before it goes into Solaris, it's at its cleanest it can possibly be. Uh, in this case, mine was not because I literally just bashed together some design on the iPad. So I imported the the asset from Nomad Sculpt into Blender, where I could actually easily see the hierarchy uh, mirrored across the the guns. And then I basically cleaned up a few inverted normals and things like that. I renamed the hierarchy, so I just got a cleaner thing I could work with. So you could kind of see the different parts. I then assigned a material to each one. And this material is what's going to become my Houdini material shop path, I believe it's called, which we can use later on in Solaris and, and in Substance Painter for kind of creating texture sets. So I assigned a material to this in Blender. So there's just one of those little shaders on there. But this is not the final thing and it's not the final color. It's just to show me the locations visually where the materials will be on this model. So this is kind of like the cleaned up version and the mirrored geometry across there. So there's no displacement or anything like that or textures. It's just essentially the model. Um, and before I can actually if this had really good UVs at this point, or I could UV this here, I could put this into Substance Painter and I could have a clean model that could go into Houdini. And then I could have a package of textures that could go into Houdini. But I needed to take this into Houdini a little bit more and I wanted to do a few more things to it as well. So this is kind of the entry point to the Houdini file. You'll notice that I have like two main streams here and one kind of follows the other one procedurally. So Essentially, before I get going, I have a little node here which I can set loads of variables throughout my scene so I don't have to kind of keep rewriting things. So I have aliases, so you'll see the alias the asset name will be referred to the asset, things like that. I don't use them all, but I'll try to call them out. Uh, and this is just a, a digital asset I did, which it's okay. It's um, basically writing, it's setting a H script and it's setting an environment. So you can see set environment and then I'm kind of saying client is equal to this value, which is essentially what I enter in here. So I can kind of use that to set the projects because I've got quite a strict project system here. So I can kind of stay organized. Anyway, moving on, the model gets imported and we're going to go inside and just go through. This is just the entire network, which is actually quite bigger than it should be. But Essentially, I bring in the Blender file here like this, and it's kind of cleaned up, and we just have a path attribute 
any shop material path attribute here. So if I just jump to the build desktop, jump back in there, should get that attribute editor. We can kind of see all of this in here. So the first thing I needed to do with the model is I needed to fix some geometry. So I kind of went in and just fixed the, the bad glass. There was some dodgy glass stuff in here, some dodgy um, modeling on my part in Nomad Sculpt. So I, I just split the geometry based on the path name. And then I just perform a VDB and it's smooth. And then I have the, um, the plugin, the, the quad remesher, but you might be able to use the Houdini standard remesher as well. Now, um, that would probably work. So I essentially remesh this, this, this is needs to be regen regenerated, but essentially what I end up with is just a slightly cleaner. And the reason I made this a little bit higher res is I want to kind of fracture this a little bit later on. But because it's now a new piece of geometry, we lose the, the name and the shop material path. So, and before I can slot this modified piece in, I literally just add in the, the, the name, the glass shop material path here, and then I add the path back in again. So it, it kind of almost is exactly, well, it's exactly the same as what comes in must go out kind of thing. So if we just do a null, yeah, the attributes are exactly the same. So we've got 76 unique path attributes and 11 unique shop material paths. So when it comes out, we've got the same, um, and this is named the same. It's just before it was kind of bad and now it's cleaner actually less resolution, but that's fine because, um, it's cleaner resolution to fracture. So that's all I'm doing here is just, it's not even essential. And then I've done something similar with the body when I've just kind of remeshed it because there was some very unusual. Well, the topology is not great. Don't forget this has not been re in a professional way. This has been a VDB sculpt. This, this body came from a sphere. I just pulled around and boolean stuff out and then I've remeshed it. And then I remeshed it again in Houdini. And again, I've updated the shop material path and the actual um, primitive, the primitive paths here as well. So I can kind of create a hierarchy like. So again, the booster geometry at the back, I kit bash this. So it's just a bunch of cylinders. They're all different um, pieces in here. So if I press S in the viewport in here, like so, keyboard working and then I go to select all geometry you can see I can see you can see it's selecting the pieces but um, I want it to just be one piece for simplicity I don't so I, I, I essentially just there you go the booster is now one piece that's all that's doing in there just like combining the booster and just making it one piece of geometry um, so when I made all these different shapes and things in, in Nomad Sculpt, I was like just reusing shapes. I was kind of mirroring and this could be procedurally done all in Houdini if you wanted to model. This is a Houdini modeler, which I do own now, which is really, really cool, but I haven't really got into it too much at the moment, but I hope to do some more procedural modeling in Houdini. And hopefully there'll be some sculpting stuff come put into Houdini eventually. I mean, there is a sculpt tool, but it's not, dominantly a modeler is it really so well procedural modeling yes i would definitely give it a go anyway so they are optional if the model was good it wouldn't be a problem is i created groups from the shop material path and i actually originally did this using just standard nodes with the attribute string edit where i took the the primitive attribute named shot material path which is actually established during the um the blender material assignment so it goes through and it finds all the different materials here and it tells you what primitive they're assigned to and then create a group from that and you can do that with two nodes or you can do it with a, a wrangle node with one node so it's it's completely up to you so i thought that's really useful um and then any kind of glass I wanted you to see through it just for visibility. So I've just added a, an alpha onto the glass object. 
Now the UVs um, are not very good on this model and they're all flat on top of each other because Nomad Sculpts didn't really it produced a UV for each object but in zero to one space so they'd all be overlapping um, and I couldn't be bothered to try and create professional UVs and things which is bad you should always create if, again if you've got a modeler or you can do that that'd be fantastic but I didn't didn't really create good UVs in this case because it was just this is just a concept I might change it it might not get used so essentially what I did now is I want to prepare the geometry uh, for kind of auto UV in this um, tiling this so what I've done is I've got a split node here and I've emitted the wires from this next part so I don't really need to Well, I'm basically just taking the wires and I'm just, they were actually fairly decent UVs from Nomad Scope. So I'm just UV laying them and then just moving them back in again. So they're still all overlapped, but now at least the wires have got a better UV layout. So the next thing is if you look at the shot material path, you can see now all those groups and how I intend to bring these into Painter and paint each kind of texture set. So I put this through um, a loop. So I'm only using the Auto UV node. So this is probably going to take some time to process. Um, I may just speed the video up. But what I'm essentially doing is just looping through and moving each piece that is found in the shop material path into its own UV tile and giving it brand new UVs, auto UVs. So again, it's kind of a very automated approach and we may struggle with things like textile density, which I will look into a little bit more deeply after this project. Um, but you can actually set it so the, you get the best textile density for your each UV tile. And um, for now though, this is like, just a quick way of taking a model with very dodgy UVs and UVing them all apart from the wires. So if I, if I merge this back in now, in fact, this, this is processing again, but I've cached this out with a, um, a stash node. So I'm using the QL stash. So if you're not sure what QL, this QL tools are just the tool set you can you can kind of download and install um, directly into Houdini. And I've kind of installed that via um, Git. So the repository, when it's updated, will constantly, um, it will just pull it and I can just update the OTLs and my OTL path will be updated and kind of just get all the updates there as well. So. Okay, so it's finished having a moment. So, yes, I was just saying this is just a note from the QL um, tools that you can download. I'll try to point out any additional nodes that don't ship with Houdini as a standard when I'm using them or any kind of custom OTLs I've done. I'll just try to go through them. Um, so what did I do next? I auto UV'd. Fix the body a little bit so that the UVs are not groundbreaking for this, but this will essentially have produced a UV tile. Yeah, that the UVs are terrible, but essentially now we have a UV tile for each one that we can use, and we could start to think about putting that into Painter. Um, and then I just stash it again just to stop things from processing. So you can preview the shot material path with the color node can align and distribute as well and you can kind of see all your kind of pieces of geometry as well which is a really cool node and that's from um, labs that sh that's um, pretty much it doesn't ship with Houdini I think you have to kind of install labs but still really cool cool to have so next I've just got a temporary light fix which is just 
I noticed the again sloppy modeling I just needed to push the light in nothing um, too clever there and then I just essentially soften the normals and I clear everything up and I just make sure that this is going to start going out of Houdini now into Solaris and into Painter so I'm just making sure I've really wrangled all the attributes down to exactly what I need otherwise the file sizes and the processing time can become quite heavy um, so this is just visualization again it's the shop material path so you can see I'm just looking at where I want all the materials to be assigned and then I can visualize the the path as well so all the different named pieces of geometry as well so they're all unique so that and then I can visualize the again this is lab tool I can visualize the um, UDIM tiles as well and I can see those arrangements which is quite nice so that should color the um, UVs yeah it works well, colored the mesh sorry see terrible UVs but they'll probably work what we need because it's it's again it's just a prototype it's it's just something like concepting really quickly so a lot of this is pretty much very optional and very you know specific to this badly modeled play ship thing the aquabot as i'm calling it um so the next thing i did with an attribute string and this took a little bit of time and i had to kind of have the solaris um desktop open but i structured hierarchy right in soft so i could take this straight into solaris and then i set this straight into solaris so i'm going to jump through this a little bit and then revisit this part to show you i'm essentially taking everything and putting it in a very organized way and then i'm grouping some geometry that i need to animate later on so i do some kind of cycle animations on here that are always kind of on so i decided to do some groups up front in here like so so i could just gain access to these in solaris later on in a sort modify and transform them in a kind of a cycle with an expression or in chops or something like that and then i forgot um i wanted to take the neon lights and put a glass on the outside so essentially i'm taking the neon lights and i'm shrinking them down and then i'm shrinking and then i'm peeking them out a bit like so and then i'm just creating the like i did before with the string edit string i'm creating the shop and the shop material path but this time i'm just doing it in a wrangle node so this is a new piece of geometry now And then we have two like tubes inside again that might have been overkill because material x you can actually kind of create a glass and emissive material but i wanted just to have two just in case i need that for some reason so again that was kind of totally optional and so is this a lot of this this is the key thing that i found really useful so this then just goes into an object merge and I clean up the model and I create a rest position. So I'm again, just making sure I only export what I want. So this is what goes into Solaris. Uh, and then you'll have a clean model. You could actually just turn that straight into a USD. Um, now I'll, I'll just go through that right now. I'll just quickly jump into the Solaris desktop app. Oh, actually we can actually, no, I will quickly just jump. So my Solaris, Solaris um, environment my lot network is here so we can view the first entry of the component builder and this is actually referencing data within object levels so i'll just go in here and you'll see it's just an object it's just an object merge and it's simply just merging straight from the objects here so it's merging from here so it's going into a poly reduce uh, you can ignore this it's not being used at the moment but it's getting poly reduced and then it's just being brought into here so you could actually have done all of that within this node you don't have to object merge that in so what i'm doing here is i'm just poly reducing the input model here 
so it becomes the proxy mesh so that's essentially the poly reduced proxy that will be in the viewport and then this is for the edit dynamics um it's very crude um convex hull um, geometry that's just kind of done like this you know you can have many different types i've got a few just in case you could do this or you, and it's just for the dynamics when you're doing the drop lock and things it's a node that you can drop objects piles of objects or you can do the edit node where you can move things around and have the dynamics kind of um influence position as, as well so this is part of side effects as component builder and i'm doing the thing several times here with the default model and then the damage model so the damage model is it's the same model i've literally just deleted um some bits off the geometry some like grills and panels and things like that i've then added a sculpt node i've sculpted some indentations so you can see this is like missing missing wires and it's missing panelings so if we do a comparison you'll see that there's just just a variant it's just a change of model so um that's all i've done there so just to kind of create something a bit different so it's missing a few grills and a few things like that and then these are just the same but they're just resolution changes so they're just custom lots and they can go into this component builder and they can become um, geometry variants and then because i wanted to have a nice shader I decided to build a shader network so i'll just jump to the bottom of this this may try to evaluate every one of these nodes because it thinks it's about to be authored um, so it's going to go and do a poly reduction uh, for every single one of these so the level of detail one two three and four lot four is the the highest you know, the lowest poly count basically it's the one that should be further away from the camera very manual and i should really cache this um down the disk as well which is something i'll add in later i just quickly added the loading in as a last minute because i was testing um instancing and large scenes and things like that probably not required for this asset but still good to test things out workflows so this is going through it's doing the right hand side now so it's on the lod 2 so we're kind of here it's going to progress to lod 3 and then lod 4 and it should get quicker so we're in lod 3 now you can see the little description down the bottom left and then it should do this and then i'll talk about what i'm doing here so on the right here is just basically you can set up a a thumbnail and a camera to render um, icons for your usd that go into the asset library so it's totally optional that so that's kind of why i've kind of attached a look at me so i can spin the object and look at the actual object and do a little bit of like sanity checking and look dev right within this section here the authoring section so it's not really the presentation section where you do the renders and stuff but um so yeah that's kind of gone ahead now and just set all of this up so the actual material library i've got a glass shader because i've got glass on here so i've got some shattered glass this is the proxy now by the way that we're viewing so if we switch over to the oh well let's just double check we are viewing this we're viewing this damage lord one with this shader so we're viewing this damage lord one here so we're viewing this model but we're viewing the proxy so it's just a viewport representation so do you see the purpose is proxy here but if we set this to final render we'll switch this to the final render and you can see that the we have the glass shader it's assigned on here as well and it's actually assigned on this tube as well that's a very thin probably can't see that all of it but it's there um so that's all that it's doing and then i've got two shaders one they're both doing the same thing they're just kind of bringing in texture maps udim texture maps of the ambient occlusion normal and height and I've kind of messed around with the diffuse roughness and the height scale. So inside of this shader, it's just a it's just a material X shader, essentially with the ambient occlusion. And I've added a color correction so I can just play with the texture map color a bit here. 
and then I've added the normal map and the height and I think that's about it really um so the actual naming convention got here is it's just a load of variables so this is asset name is my my asset I've decided to call it and then I've got a variant texture set I want to load from disk so this this variant um is being loaded here so it, it, I could change this at any point and just find <clears throat> all of the texture sets if I go up you can see I've got lots of textures that I generated in Substance Painter and I can just find them preview them right within here I am actually going to improve this so it, it kind of finds everything in a loop and assigns the right textures to the right variant which is what I've done in the look dev scene um, but I didn't really need it for the modeling scene because I can change this I can promote these later and change these later when I'm kind of presenting the model I then converted all the textures to rats and I've got a little drop down menu which will just respect the, the resolution so I can just change that if I need to as well so um, and this is loading in a texture map baked in Substance Painter and this one is pretty much loading in the normal map and the height but this time it's using the the, the idea is it uses the CPU renderer not the XP render and it, you can generate occlusion on the fly so I'll, I'll show that working in just a sec I probably could show that now actually so there's the karma there's the karma ambient occlusion being rendered there and then if I was to switch to the CPU and I change the so it's still rendering the same shader it's not changed the shader at the moment see XPU OC but if I change that while well, while we're still previewing this CPU <clears throat> it's now doing like a CPU based occlusion you get kind of like quite deep and different type of ambient occlusion on there so it just might be a different look that we need for a presentation or something like that who knows so essentially that is the the model coming in i decided to keep it really um simple for now you can you could bring in all the textures and do everything in one go but it just becomes um and that's pretty much how i think they intended to use the component builder but i feel i wanted to work in a kind of a department way so i could kind of keep my <laughs> scenes a little bit more organized um and actually use different houdini files you don't have to do that you can work any way you like but this is really nice because i can save this to disk now and all that gets kind of compressed downwards so before i jump away into this part here the the ambient occlusion maps when i baked them i had substance painter i've got um for this so i i baked out when you do your baking of the maps and things i baked out vertex ids I generated in Houdini and uh, these are the IDs these are actually generated in Houdini and I can use these for kind of instancing the material across texture sets so these are texture sets and I can instance the if you don't know Substance Painter I do apologize but I, I would highly recommend doing some um, intro courses on it it's a very handy little tool to have in in your toolkit uh, and I wish I took the time to learn this a lot earlier in my career, but I was doing a lot of creature effects simulation work. <laughs> you don't really do much texturing. Um, but I've really enjoyed it because I come from an artistic background, not a technical background. So I, I just really love kind of getting back into this kind of th stuff. Um, anyway, the, um, the vertex color is baked from a high res model that I provided from Houdini onto the low res model here so we can use these ids to kind of instance materials across and i'll i could go over this if people are interested in that but the ambient occlusion this is a baked ambient occlusion and the one thing i'll talk about is you may notice this ambient occlusion might look a little bit strange because there isn't ambient occlusion in the crevices and i chose to do that i chose to bake each piece kind of separately um so that if we decided to make this 
thing explode or break up, then you wouldn't have dirty lines kind of when when these things rotate or these things rotate you might see like an ambient occlusion line underneath which you did so i kind of baked out these a certain way so if we go to the baking section oops wrong one baking section here while that's kind of loading i'll just jump into the equivalent section here we're back here again if you remember we were going through the uvs cleaning up the model and this is what's going into solaris and the hierarchy is defined by this organized structure node and then when i send it to painter i'm essentially this is not required anymore i was moving the lens out and i was just making sure that i've only got attributes i need for painter which it does need paths and a shot material path and i do a divide because apparently that helps with the displacement in painter divide this model and then i created this string called painter low and what that's actually doing i could uh bring up the it's just changing the path temporarily to low here. And then I do the same with the, the high res one, but I change it to uh, uh, low and high. See, this is high. So Painter, if it finds geometry with an underscore low and an underscore high, it'll map the, the baking of the ambient occlusion and the curvatures. To, it'll bind them just exclusively to those pieces of geometry. Um, and that's kind of how I decided to go about it. So I, I essentially bake out the geometry using, oh, well, you can actually create your own, but this is the default string. So if it finds it, it'll kind of match each piece like so. And then you can get a very clean, normal bake, a map that's baked from the norm, from the high res to the low res. So you can achieve really clean normals, a displacement, curvature, ambient occlusion, and things like that. So. That took a while for me to figure out, but I prefer that way. Um, I think you just get a better like, ambient occlusion. So you could essentially just isolate and you can see you've got nice clean ambient occlusion. So you might not want that. You don't have to do it this way and you can actually have all this really dark and that would be very similar to if I rendered this with the CPU ambient occlusion. Um, so if that's what you need, you could do that at the moment. I don't think the ambient occlusion the live ambient occlusion in material x works with xpu so i i've just baked them from and it was much quicker to do a baked map anyway whether you're doing baked in ambient occlusion or just this kind of type of ambient occlusion it's much quicker to load the maps in when they're converted to a wrap and just do a presentation ambient occlusion or even use them in your shaders um yeah the and this is the texturing. So I'll talk about the textures when I do the look dev. Um, but essentially, I've created um, let's just you know different texture sets based off of the export that I did in Houdini. So I could get control of each piece, do a little bit more kind of layering of the the layer stack and texturing and stuff here. So. And the idea was to kind of create a scene where I could kind of go default yellow O1, make a change, default yellow O2, O3, and just export. And they all go to their own kind of respective folder. And then all I have to do is change the, like, some of the wear on here and stuff. So if you look at the body texture here, I was change some of the warm paint in here. I created different colors, got a yellow, and if you turn that off, you'll just get like the primer or something. But then you can just fill it with like a red and then change the wear level down here and get a different version, save it as default red or one or two or three, whatever. Um, and then I'm going to use those names to cycle through and create as many variant material variants as I need like within Houdini. So that was quite a nice little recovery.
So that's kind of what I'm doing here in the object level. Like this is a branch that's just exclusive for Substance Painter for this model. So the only thing that I need from Substance Painter are the maps that I export. So that happens here. And I actually just used the same maps for the damaged version. So I didn't really send the damaged version to Substance Painter because the UVs were the same. It's just literally missing geometry. Um, so the other thing I did with the high res model that is used to bake detail onto the low res, there isn't really any detail on the high res, but I did create um, a group and I experimented with creating some like IDs and some bolts around here. So I essentially took that group you've just seen and created the world's most elaborate bolt. <laughs> Um, there it is. So uh, that was just kind of just done in Houdini. You can, I mean, just, well, it doesn't matter. You just need a piece of geometry that looks like a bolt. And I just quickly knocked that up. Um, and then I took the, the geometry. That, this is the old geometry. So if we go back up, that's the group that we created the rings around. Just blasted that away. And I create a normal on the geometry to make sure I've got like a location that I can use. I extract each point, and then I put the normal back onto those points. So I've got, you see, like a um, directional vector, and I just make sure that those points are flat against the original geometry. Create an up vector, and then I use Mops as free toolkit. This, if you don't know about Mops. Just check it out. It's incredible. Um, you can pay for Mops Plus. This is the standard Mops, and it's just it just ships with tons of really cool little nodes that can help you. And this randomizes um, the orientation in a certain axis. Um, so what I'm doing here is let me just move through this. I'm copying that object on to the orientation of the normal. Then I'm randomizing. So the Mops randomize just randomizing them so they're not all just like riveted in the same position they've kind of got a little bit of rotation on them um and this was just a i was just pushing them down a little bit on like, through in the normal direction i didn't really actually use this i was going to put a noise in this so each one would get a slight kind of you know offset as they were like riveted into the panel but i I don't think I actually actioned that. Then I clean it up and then on this side here I bring the model in and I decide to create um color IDs and they're actually vertex colors. So the first thing I do is I create the base one and then I create things that I think I might use for paint work. And I'm using the path name for these groups. So if you do change the model shape and the name doesn't change, these would still be okay. So I go through and I do this, I do this, you can see I'm just kind of colouring and then doing a mitt, which is probably uh, yellow. It's, yeah, the lights, so I'm just kind of grouping the lights as well. And then it gets to the point where you might need to do groups off of the geometry, off of the topology, which is why I've put this here, polygroups, to remind me if I change something, the chances I will have to redo these groups. But I decided to create a an emit, very silly, because you could probably do this in Painter, but uh, and a mask, just a, a color mask here and in there. So that's all that that's doing. So if I bypass that, bake the color in, and then did a purple one. Probably can't remember what it's for. I think it's for the front of the ship, probably from in in here. Yeah. So it's it's basically just creating another mask I can use. So. You'll see those in Substance um, Painter, I hope. <laughs> if I've changed something. So in the IDs, you you should see, um, yeah, I may have changed the colors a little bit, but you can see I've got those IDs in here now. And I can actually use, and you can see I've baked the bolts out as well. Um, you can see I can use that. ID to kind of create an emissive effect on there as well. I 
and we can do further modifications in Houdini as well. We could add a sh shader to the geometry and things. So where were we? We were here. Yeah, so then I essentially now transferred the um, shot material path across so that it kind of tricks Houdini thinking that these belong on the same object and it also helped with painter baking stuff out so essentially you get a final model a very high risk model if you will so if this had sculpted details on they would be baked into your low res model and uh, so maybe that would be coming in from a zbrush model or something but you will get the ids will be the same for the the panels here and they're actually named the same so now houdini thinks that these bolts belong to this geometry and, and, and painted will think that as well because they have the same shot material path um, so that's my kind of high res geometry just jump out of this messy network so that's kind of what that is so then i, I attach the painter string high here yeah, like so and now i essentially send a low one that i'm going to paint and a high res one that i'm going to bake um the top graph is a bit pointless but it essentially just bakes both of those to disc i'm not using the zbrush one at the moment so yeah and this align and distribute is not used i just was <laughs> just like looking at this because this is interesting is that you can actually if you played your cards right with this kind of setup you can have the um geometry all matching perfectly which it does this showcases that it's going to work in substance painter when it's mapping um stuff across because i'm using the path attribute to align them and the paths is technically two different paths two different name underscore low underscore high in this case and this is mapping it and that's essentially what substance painter does when it bakes those textures out it does the same thing so again not used just a visualization but these did go to disk and these were imported into substance painter and baked and then i could start doing all my texturing and, and things like that and then i could export these to a folder which is more about the this is more kind of look debbie stuff but right now the model this is the same setup the damaged version pulls in the the full model and then i am just manually grouping and deleting stuff and then that goes into Solaris and then I do a little setup here down here where I add further modifications so I just to I like I did experiment with procedurally um deleting groups as well which was working but um you need to omit certain bits you never want to be deleted otherwise it will randomly yeah so the the random selection node again a labs node very useful this will randomly delete bits but you want to just make sure it doesn't uh, delete the major player in your design you know if you, but in order to do that you could just use group combines and things like that to admit that but i didn't really need it but it's quite nice for like removing random primitives not not the actual geometry but like the actual full and that's because I've created this connectivity attribute by piece and created a class. But I actually didn't use it, that's why the switch is pointed here. I just manually went in for now um, and did just remove. So these orange ones are ones that they, they get deleted. Um, so they'll go into solaris as the damaged version you see that's what we're going to render you may notice there's a sculpt node i very dirtily just hit the sculpt and just sculpted in some damage and stuff so you know not not brilliant but you would normally work on this a little bit more and maybe that would go into substance painter and you could make your smart materials chip away the paint with that is but in this case i'm going to use the same materials on the damaged version and i'm just being very again i'm prototyping so i'm quickly just sculpting uh, cleaning up any unnecessary attributes always check your your attributes that's really important adding the rest position into this so that if i do any procedural shading work like 
here then that's going to not float in space uh, and then I decided to smash the glass so I just did a quick smash of the glass um, again I am scattering some points off the curvature doing an RBD fracture um, see it's just fracturing really and I'm smashing the glass um, I'm creating a group here and then I'm doing a group expand and I'm just blasting away based on the group and um, so that way I actually get the full end of pieces of glass quite thick glass um, and then I'm just clearing everything up again so again it's important because I'm essentially taking this and modifying this and then placing it back in position so you want to make sure you don't add additional attributes to make sure that what comes in must go out the same unless you intend to add something don't add anything um, yeah, I probably need to clean up that I think it renders okay so that was just to give visually something really quick just a different variant um, so you, you know on top of that you could have unique material as well um, so this was ready for painter again as I explained earlier but I didn't actually use that so um, so that's the default and the damage models kind of prepared to go into Solaris and the LODs so that's where we are with this <laughs> that's kind of what all of that was there and then those materials and you can see now where the textures came from so we would hit save and it saves to disk I save to a global asset library and then I can use that on any project if I want so I'm still on the fence with this part but I, I bring this in as a sub layer so you might notice there's quite a few things going off in here so the first one is the direct reference to what I've just saved out so it's essentially is that right so and then the second one is the look dev scene um, which it's a modeling asset so it doesn't really need to be on at this moment in time that's my mistake and the second one is I created some animation in a different file where I brought in the model USD I did some procedural like looping animation of this which came at a later stage so I kind of went back in and just added that in as a sub layer to the to the model right so yeah so we've still got aquabot one but I want to kind of create two and do a nice turntable and apply the shader and render that so I can find the model so this is what this node does down here it's a sub it's a sub network but it'll duplicate across and it'll create aquabot one and two and they'll both have like a nice animation that we can line up through the camera so if we just drop in the camera here talk about these in just a second but essentially that spins them around in a nice way so inside of there it's kind of very very similar on the left to the right but I'm just creating animations so I'm creating a just an animation that just rocks back and forth using a sign expression so it's kind of like a live animation I don't need it to go any, anywhere else um, and then I'm just moving this 90 degrees and this makes sense when you're looking through the camera I'm creating a turntable and it's basically using the, the range for timeline so I always render 200 frames and it's going to spin it around and then after 100 frames it just stays in, in, in place and then I might rotate the IBL around and then I just move this over to the left and then everything else gets the same treatment apart from this doesn't get a top view so again it gets the same thing and then this just gets the inverse of that it's just referenced in so if I change this one to the left that one inverses to the right a little bit more procedurally so you just get a little a little scene like that so again nothing nothing fancy but it, it's consistent and I, I kind of would probably use this um, set up in all of my kind of look dev so when I do the asset stuff I'd have the, like a modeling scene with this in and the look dev and then the lighting so I'd alter all the departments into that you know all the all the departments would alter their contributions into this asset I guess and, and use the same kind of render settings as well here this emit node here is just gaining access to this node and this is direct copy and it's gaining access to this um, 
primitive down here. So there's one and two, and it's gaining access to the materials inside of here. So I created a modeling department materials where you can see them, and it's gaining access to this material. And I can change the, the material set I want to look at. So I can have default yellow one to three that I have on disk, or one or default red. And each one ships with its own ambient occlusion height and normal. And then this references the color parameters within the shader that is now baked into the USD, but is actually originally inside of here. And it's this dude here. These are the maps we're manipulating. And that was just a, a last minute thing. So I can kind of control the, the gamma a little bit and the gain of the texture map on here. Um, but that's only for this um, XPU awk. I could switch this out to the CPU awk and I could do something similar. So the possibilities are quite endless and I guess you know you could keep going as long as you want <laughs> keep customizing stuff uh, but I just wanted a template that I could throw sketches in to a system and it you know it would just work so this bit's really not modified too much apart from you be changing the amount of variance up here I guess everything else should just auto assign <clears throat> So yeah, that should that should render now. Um, and I've got a little node here I made. It needs a little bit more work, but it's just some common stuff that I keep doing. So and right now it's intended to be used across modeling, look dev and lighting, just to kind of for the asset kind of look dev. So it's just a lot net inside. It's just a bunch of um, render settings that all export to different to do different things so it's culling the geometry it's kind of like creating prim vars and things for crypt crypto mats and um it's culling geometry for certain scenarios and it's creating exclusive things for like doing the macbeth and the color balls and things well um <clears throat> so the beauty pass is the main pass the crypto mats I always render crypto mats separately just so I don't have to re-render a full render. And also when I'm comping in Fusion, the crypto mats EXRs need to be in legacy <clears throat> format so that the actual crypto mat will work. So and this is just pruning some objects. So I'm just pruning the lights and just getting a crypto mat ID in case I wanted to do something really quick with those like tracking for lens flares and stuff like that um, and the occlusion pass this will hide all the lights and it will just assign the the shader that what, pretty much what we're doing in this scene but this node here will be used by lighting and look dev as well so they can switch this to this mode and just get an occlusion render which I'll demonstrate later on uh, this is a utility pass um, which switches to a uh, CPU render for things like Things that XPU can't handle, or some AOVs that you can't use, like UVs and motion vectors, <clears throat> velocity, and then um, then some standard things as well, just for the hell of it. So you can layer up AOVs as well, um, and then that's just fetching in the. I think that's just fetching in the. It might be broken, <laughs> but it's supposed to fetch in the. Um, <clears throat> it's worked. <clears throat> it just renders the reference ball as well in a separate pass and I can composite that in later on. So that switch is basically driven by this. So this is kind of um a collection of nodes, if you will, all kind of promoted to the top. So I can kind of start to render The beauty pass in this case it will just be the illusion and it's being lit by an environment map that we have so it's being lit by this so if you wanted to do something a bit flatter you can just create an environment map with no texture map in there so you get a really flat version uh, you'll also have the albedo as well which is very flat so if you did <clears throat> have an environment map in your render your albedo will be well, it'll just be very flat. You could use that instead of using the color map here. Um, 
it, again it's down to what you want to to do really so that's the the model uh, workflow that i've got for just reviewing my models um, and then i can quickly jump to maybe the asset ref still works i don't know um, yep and i can jump to the well the occlusion out will give probably similar result but probably a flat version because it's just doing an internal thing so it might not actually be needed but there you go and then we could do the crypto mats as well so but that's mainly for look dev and that's for lighting and things but you'll see that i've set up things like crypto mats and stuff so if i want and this is all like local this is just happening right now in this session so whatever i set here doesn't affect what i send to disk so <clears throat> When I send this to disk, I can just enable the passes. So each one of those passes is pretty much being sent to tops. And then I'm basically feeding those into a switch node and I can activate the different um, tasks, I guess. So I'm bringing the USD um, sit here and then I can render. That's kind of how I've done that. And that's just a nice way of just sending that to the farm overnight. Just coming into some nice um, modeling turntable renders, I guess. Uh, so that's kind of like just my little, it's still in development. I'm still kind of thinking of different things and I need to tidy stuff up, but it was kind of a bit of a journey just in, in new territory for me as well. So it was quite fun to do. So um, yeah, so you can do some nice things. You can actually bring in the, this is a separate thing altogether, just bringing in the, the model. Again, you'll notice it's referencing here. it's actually on disk this model it's like a file on disk um and then i'm exploring the variants so i'm kind of exploring them all so you'll see that down here it's kind of sh sh showing the geometry variants that i've got and they're all stacked together they, you can actually display these outwards so you'd see them um but i'm actually going to instance these so i'm going to create a collection so that's just basically creating a collection with this node in because i'm going to isolate it so I'm going to prune this and then I have a little grid in here with some points on it. I created a group called random selection like so and that's one side that's the other side and then I can instance um, look at that it's like instancing so well so that's instancing the default and then this will instance the the damaged version as well so it's mixing together both am i still viewing the proxy I don't think I am. <laughs> yeah, so let's just view the proxies. That would help. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so this was just an instance, just trying to instance this. And I was just basically using the auto select log you know, to kind of go through and grab all my instances and change the loading based on the camera distance. So if I was to look at the camera distance, yeah you'll notice that it should essentially map the the LODs in the, in the correct way. So sidetracked a little bit. I was just trying to learn a new node every day in Solaris. <laughs> so um, this should uh, render quite efficiently as well. So you've got um, two variants, the damaged and the default being instance and you have the, um, the less detailed odd versions towards the back so yeah it's, it's pretty fun to do stuff like this in houdini yeah so just some tests that's the render and then there's a fusion comp so yeah it's um been having a lot of fun with it really so you can just take an ipad sculpt and get something quite nice out of it so i hope you've uh, found this useful 
<laughs> and thanks for watching.